Hi, this Hi. is uh, Ms. Linton, and this is my wonderful AP Biology class conglomerate. Say hi. Hi. And what are we going to do today? Yay. We want to get 100% on our essays, yes? So how about that unit? Because it looks pretty massive, does it not? Yeah. Yes, chapter 5, 6, 7, and 8. Ah. Remember chapter 5 we learned before we went away and took our unit test. Remember we moved the unit test? Yeah. Remember that? Okay. And, um, oh no. Wait, pause. Okay, I'm back. Sorry, I had this pause and all of a sudden I was like, where are all the things I put in there? Okay. So if we want to start um, this unit, I want to remind you, where can you get a copy of potential essays you could prepare for? Yeah, where? Resources for review. Remember there are two resources for review. There's Essays New School, and that's what I call them, because this is ever since the AP exam changed in 2013. And there are grid-ins. And I give you potential grid-ins for that. And then there are more, uh, there are longer responses, free response questions as well, okay? Some of these are, here you can see where it says free response. Some of these, remember, they're asking it at the, at the culmination of the course, your hair looks so cute. They're asking at culmination of the course, so you have to pull from a lot of different things in order to answer that question, right? So some are gonna be harder to answer, so it's, I don't really break them down individual units. I break it to individual semesters worth of material. Like you should be able to do that sometime this semester. These would be really good ones to prepare also for your semester final, okay? So you want to be working on these. These are a Google Doc. So one very easy thing to do is to make a copy of that Google Doc and then work on your answers. Another very easy thing to do would be to get the answers from somebody else who has already taken this class. However, that is not going to help you when you go to take your exam. Because what really helps is when you go through and you get the answers yourself, when you work through the problems yourself, then you know the steps and the hurdles that you're gonna run into, right? And so that's why I strongly encourage you to do that. Because they're probably not gonna ask, ask it exactly like this when you take your AP exam. They're gonna ask some different way. And if you've memorized the response to this one discrete question in the way I've provided it to you, it doesn't mean you understand it at all. But I will have people that do that, and they will do okay on their tests, and then they will get a three on their AP exam instead of a four, or a four instead of a five. So they really don't understand what they're doing. They're just doing a lot of memorization. So there are questions there, and I tried to pull from this, ones that had to do with this unit, and I put them in a notebook thing so I can talk to you about that, okay? Then the second one, which, oh, hello. Um, essay, essays old school, I like these because these just make sure that you have the content right. Now I have not updated this since we went to the newer essays and I changed my units around a little bit. So what you have to do is you really just have to read through them and go, okay, is, that, is this one about this particular unit? Like, do you see any questions right now about this particular unit on here? Yes or no? Yes, what one? Number three, exactly. So you scroll through and I have them, I just want it, I just, I want you to know they're not broken up. This is not our, our, I used to do double units because I tried that one year just to see <laughs> if that would help them because the AP exam is so huge. So it was a strategy we tried out. So instead of having a test over four chapters, you'd have a test over eight. What? No, I did it for the whole year. I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind having a chapter. What? Well, the exams were worth twice as much, and they were twice as long. Oh, I thought they were like yeah, one test, but like. But I found that that was it had its it's good parts, and that's why it's broken down. Like, this would have all have been right here, all of unit one. All, all of this. All of this would have been unit one. What you're doing now in two and what you already did in one would have all been one unit. Does that make sense? But we're not doing that, okay? 
So then I went and grabbed from the old school and the new school, the ones that are appropriate, I believe, I, I mean, I would double check it, the ones that are appropriate for um, the, this particular um, unit. Did I push start? Oh, I did, good. Okay, so the first one on there is describe the model of the cell membrane of a eukaryotic cell. So the first thing you need to do is you would need to tell me the components of a cell membrane, right? What are the different parts? And then the different ways in which substances move across the membrane. In your discussion, be sure to indicate whether your examples are passive or active transport. So one of the first things you'd want to do is be able to, I'm just drawing it for you here. Right, you would want to be able to describe about proteins, right? Yeah, what am I going to draw right now? It's peripheral. peripheral, good. So you would want, what else needs to be in my cell membrane? Cholesterol. cholesterol. And if I'm putting cholesterol in here, it must be what kind of cell, what kind? Animal, Animal cell. cell. What did I just do there? Uh, Glycolipid and glycoprotein, right? So, right, you would need to be able to describe each part and then it says, so you, it says describe the model of the cell membrane. The model of the cell membrane is a phospholipid model or a fluid mosaic model is better. Fluid mosaic because the mosaic part are the proteins, right? And then, and then the fluid part are the phospholipids, yeah, that are embedded in there. Okay, and then discussing the different ways in which substances can and move across, the three big ways are what? Through the phospholipid bilayer using channels or carriers and endo and exocytosis. If you go through the phospholipid bilayer, that is always going to be what? Active or passive? Passive. passive. Who can, you can't you and the only ones you can't go through the phospholipid bilayer if you are what large, large or charged okay so small usually nonpolar molecules with the exception of water. water who can be assisted using what aquaporins right um, will move through the phospholipid bilayer now if you're larger charged one way would be to use a channel or a carrier if you go with the gradient, it's called passive. If you go against the gradient, active, right? But proteins serve other roles other than channels and carriers. They are what? Cell recognition, receptors, enzymatic, and then we talked about junctions. Adhesion junctions, remember the different ones? Tight junctions, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it says, and discuss different ways in which substances move across the cell membrane. What's the third way? We did this and this. What's the third way? Endo and exo. And that is always going to be what? Active transport. Because you're moving whole cell membranes and specifically the cytoskeleton. Yes? Okay, and then endocytosis, there were three types. Pino, phagocytosis, and receptor mediated to bring it in. And then you would differentiate between those and then exocytosis. Uh-oh, is it going to pause? No, it's still moving. <laughs> Will it still record? Yes, it's still recording. Okay, and then in your discussion, be sure to indicate whether your examples are passive or active. So you need to flesh that out a little bit, but that's a good starting point, yes? Okay. Another question, this is an old school one, is a laboratory assistant prepared solutions of 0 0.7, 0 0.5, 0 0.3, and 0 0.1 molar sucrose, but forgot to label them. After realizing the error, he took off to Mexico, which I misspelled, and then his assistant randomly labeled the flask containing these four unknown solutions as flask A, B, and C, and D. Design an experiment based on the principles of diffusion and osmosis. If I had to design an experiment based on the principles of diffusion and osmosis, one of the first things I would do is tell you what is 
diffusion and osmosis that the assistant could use to determine which of the flasks contain each of the four unknown solutions, including your answer, a description of how you would set it up, the results you would expect, and an explanation of those results. What does that sound like? Our lab, right? Now, am I going to need to use potatoes in this lab? Absolutely not. Okay, what will I use in this lab though? Dialysis tubing. What would be the best way to set this lab up? The best way to set this lab up? One, two, three, four. What do you think? Yes? With the four flasks, a control that's distilled water, and then fill your dialysis tubing with distilled water, and then... Okay, so there you've given me one. So 0, 0.0, where are you going to put that 0, 0.0 molarity? Where are you going to put the distilled water in the in the in the, in the beaker? In, all of them have water in the beaker? No. Yes. Well, yes, but like some of them have sucrose molarities, not all distilled. So wait, you would put sucrose in the beakers? No, you would put sucrose in the bag. I would put distilled water. Yes, I would put distilled water. That just stands for double distilled water in all of these. Right? Water in all of them. Right? In all. Okay, then what? Now, I'm going with you still. What are you saying? Then one of these you would put some dialysis tubing and you would put water in it? Yeah, and that would be the control. And that would be your control. And then then you, what would you do? Then you would do dialysis tubing, but you would take some from each of the flasks and put it in there. And then you would label them according to the flasks. And then... Right? You would put some of each flask inside, mm -hmm. okay? Now, who can take off from there? I understand the premise of her experiment. What would she need to tell me before, this is just a little detail I wanna draw your attention to. Before you put that tubing into those beakers of water, what would you need to do? Tell me everybody. Yeah. Mass. mass, initial mass, okay? Then you would put them in the distilled water. You would be sure to tell me that. Then what would happen? Time it, you would keep time as a constant. So maybe how long are you going to time it? 30 minutes. 30 minutes? Okay. So you would mass, right, the tubing. You would talk about the water setup. You would give me a certain amount of time. And then what would you do? <laughs> then what would you do? Take them out and mass them again. Then what would you do? You would want to calculate the percent change in mass. Why? You can't just say the bag that changed the most mass, right? Are all the bags the same size bag? You hope so, right? But you want to account for any of those variables by doing percent change in mass, right? Final minus initial over initial and give me the percent change in mass, yes? Yeah. Okay. Should all those numbers be positive? Should all be negative? Well, we don't it's know what he's testing the... Oh, so yeah. 0.7? You think that... What's going to happen there? Oh, it's going to lose. It's going to lose weight in water? No, it's going to gain weight. It's going to gain weight. Why? Because it's hypertonic. Distilled water is hypotonic. Water must flow from the hypo. Right? I'm going to ask you again. Are all of them going to gain weight? Yes. 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 Who's the only one that might not gain weight? Control, control. Exactly. Should it change weight? No. no. Okay. It might, but that's not right. Like, oh, I might have done it wrong. Okay. So now from that, you would tell me then what? How could you tell me which solution is which? The one that had the greatest positive change, percent change of mass, highest molarity, and, and you would just work from then on, right? Then the second most would be the next, right? And you would explain that to me. You got that? Okay. I'm just checking, make sure, make sure that you get it. Just checking. Okay. Next. Look at your next question.
Okay. Enzymes are. Oh, thank you. Enzymes are biological catalysts. Biological catalysts. What does that mean? They speed up, our, speed up the rate of a reaction. It says relate the chemical structure of an enzyme. Chemical structure of enzyme to its what? Specificity and its catalytic ability. So in A, you would want me to know that enzymes are built out of proteins. What else would you want to tell me? How are proteins built? Amino acids. Okay. So give me some more on that. How do we know how proteins are built? So they're going to be built with R groups, which is going to change the... Okay, structure. be more specific. I know about R groups. Do I have anything here? Primary... Secondary... Yeah. Okay, so you would talk to me about primary through quaternary structure and what that means, right? What's primary structure? Sequence of amino acids. What's the secondary structure? Either an alpha helix or a beta bleated sheet. And that is not dependent on our group, right? That's just the carboxyl and the amino group. Amino group is probably positively charged. Carboxyl is. Okay, tertiary stru structure is the folding pattern imposed upon the secondary structure due to the R group. Quaternary structure is more than one chain, right? So you would tell me that a protein shape, right, its configuration, right, the, the, its functionality is highly dependent upon its shape because you know for enzymes they have what's called an active site that is specific to their substrate, right? So if their active site changes, their functionality changes because they will no, no longer be able to bind to their substrate, right? So what kind of things can affect protein structure? pH, temperature, right? So you know the lab you just did? What did we vary on enzyme functionality? What did we vary? Substrate concentration. Could we do the same lab but vary the pH of the catalase? Yes. yes. Could we do the same lab and vary the temperature of the catalase? Yes. Yes. Would that be this question? Yes. Yeah, you don't have to come up with a new lab like, oh, I bet Miss Lynn wants me to be creative. I don't. Okay? <laughs> I would say catalase breaks down as a catabolic reaction and it degrades hydrogen peroxide into oxygen and water. By varying the temperature of the catalase, or by varying the pH that I mix the catalase into, that could alter the structure of the protein, right? And I could measure that quantitatively how? The production of oxygen, quantitatively, right? I could use probeware to measure how much oxygen is produced. We could also use potassium permanganate to measure the residual hydrogen peroxide, but we didn't learn that experiment. But I'm going to tell you if they ever throw something at you like that, potassium permanganate will interact with hydrogen peroxide and it'll go from when you drop the potassium permanganate in there, it's purple. When you react, when it has any hydrogen peroxide to react it with, it goes from purple to clear, right in front of your eyes. So it's drop, it goes clear, 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 clear. And you measure how many drops you have. And then all of a sudden, it doesn't go clear anymore. It turns brown. And you're like, oh, all the hydrogen peroxide's gone. So however how much potassium permanganate you dropped in there is equal to how much hydrogen peroxide was remaining didn't get catalyzed. OK, sure, we got that, Ms. Lynn. Yes? <laughs> um, was purple then turned clear? Why would it turn brown after the hydrogen peroxide? Must be with whatever. When the hydrogen peroxide interacts with potassium peroxide, I could show you the equation. Yeah, it just kind of goes to a browny kind of Offer color. Yeah. Okay, but that would be another way to measure it. So design a quantitative experiment um, to investigate blah, blah, blah. Describe what information concerning the structure of the enzyme could be inferred from your experiment. If you're not getting a bunch of oxygen production, then something must be wrong with your enzyme catalase. What could be wrong? You could have denatured it, right? Either by cha changing the pH or denature it by changing the temperature. 
right? Because we know primary second, you're not going to alter the primary structure of the protein, are you? No. What's the primary structure? The sequence of amino acids. You're not changing that. But the way the chains interact in the, in the quaternary structure or the folding pattern imposed on the tertiary structure, right? That could all be impacted by having a whole bunch of hydrogen ions or not as much hydrogen ions, right? Change the shape, change the functionality. Change how much product you get at the, or how much reactant you use, okay? That's that question. Yes, what are you confused about? Okay, well, yeah. Okay. So, with concentration, if there's more substance concentration, how would that affect the... Well, if you have a very, very low concentration of hydrogen peroxide, as in 0% okay. or 0.01% hydrogen peroxide, then it doesn't have very much substrate, so you would not expect it to have very much product. Okay. But as you increase the substrate, you should increase your product, right, until you reach a saturation point. It would be hard to measure at that probe wear, right, because we did 3%, right, and then all of a sudden... We could, de we could have decreased how much catalase we used, and then maybe we might have hit a saturation point. So, but it doesn't do anything to the shape? No. Okay. okay? But that's not the question I asked you on here. <coughs> okay. Um, the net balanced equation for respiration is quite simple, but for respiration is quite a complex process. The very first thing I would do is give me the equation. equation. I would write the equation for cellular respiration. The simplified or the more complex? Complex. C6, right? H12O6 plus 602 goes to 6CO2 plus 6H2O plus 36 to 38 ATP old school, 32, 34 new school, right? Okay. So plus ATP or plus energy. All right. I and it says using diagrams and written explanations, describe the metabolism of glucose including glycolysis, anaerobic fermentation, the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain. Diagrams are useful, but must be a supplement to the writing. Okay, so I want you to explain it, but if I ask you on the test, diagram the Krebs cycle for me. What, how does it go? Two plus four is six. Okay, now, when I do the two plus four is six, if I was doing this on a diagram, okay? Is there, is, you said two plus four is six, right? Yeah. Is there a difference between this and this? Yes. 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 Hear me when I say that. I've asked this question before, whether it was the citric acid cycle or the light independent reaction, and I had people writing two C. If I see two C, I'm going to think a C and then another I've got two of them, right? Because it implies everything after it. C2 is different. That means there's a carbon connected with another carbon. They are together, right? Okay. So if you are going to tell me C2, right, or C4 right here, and then your C2 is up here, and you add that in, then it's going to be a C6. Then you're going to what? And then you're going to have a what? C5. C5. And then what? Are you going to use the words do the bit in your essay to me? No. Because no. that's not biological. That's just a litanism, right? Okay. And then what are you going to tell me? Now, I'm going to tell you this. I'm writing this very simply, but we're, this is correct, just pulling off the CO2, but what should I have up here? Reduction and oxidation. Yes. <laughs> That's what you meant, right? Yeah, is that what it was? ATP. And here I would have what? AD It's an inorganic phosphate. Okay. Inorganic phosphate. <laughs> okay, what else? <laughs> right? 
That's how you would write those kind of things out. But you also would want to explain glycolysis, you want to do a transition, Krebs cycle, electron transport chain, right? Now, this, I'm expecting you to know it at a higher level than what they're expecting. I'm just telling you that right now. Yes? For glycolysis, do you just want us to say that there's enzymes that break up the glucose, or would you say there's like every single step? We don't know all 10 steps in glycolysis. So you would just tell me glucose is broken down into pyruvate in 10 different steps, 10 different enzymes. There's an energy investment stage that you have to invest to ATP, and there's energy harvesting stages where you retrieve 4 ATP or form 4 ATP and 2 reduced NAD. So net total 2 ATP. Yes? On a deeper level, are you talking about making the way the hydrogen goes? Or? This that I've taught you and what happens all along, they won't ask you that. Oh, okay. I'll show you the kind of questions they will ask you. It'll be more general, like what is the significance of a membrane in mitochondria and chloroplasts? What is generated across it for what purpose? Yeah. Okay. Um, then it says describe a lab in which you could measure respiration. Do we have a lab where we would measure respiration? Yes. No. We didn't do one. I will teach you one just for the AP exam as we start reviewing, but I'm not going to go over that today because you don't need to know it right now and you're not that interested. But when you think about it later, you're going to want to know it for the AP exam and I will go over that with you. Okay? All right. Another question. Boy, this looks familiar. Now write the net, net balanced equation for photosynthesis. Quite simple, but super complex. Write your equation out for photosynthesis. These are things where I might ask you to write the equa equation and then identify what gets reduced and oxidized. Neither one of these. Identify what gets reduced, what gets oxidized. Surprising how many people cannot do that. Okay. All right, and then um, next, okay, it says um, these are all the steps, right? You know the steps. Then it says describe in lab in which you can measure photosynthesis. Did you do a lab? Are you doing a lab that you can? Yes. Without even doing it, you could still answer this essay question, right? Okay, and that's the beauty of it. By understanding a lot of labs, you can still write about them even if you haven't done it. At this point, you should be able to tell me about using leaf discs, right, and varying the concentration of bicarbonate, which is a CO2 source for the light independent reactions, right? And then you would talk to me about as it generates oxygen, it should cause the leaves to become more buoyant, yeah? Cause them to float. And that would be a way to measure that. Okay, um, another question. This would be a sample grid in. So I encourage you to, to look at those. Potato cores were placed in solutions of varying concentrations and were found to neither gain nor lose mass in a sucrose solution of 0.32. Huh, interesting. Use this information to calculate the solute potential of potato cells. The temperature of the solution is 22 degrees Celsius. So I'm thinking this, right? And I'm going to say to you, who are you talking to? I'm going to say to you, at the point where it doesn't gain or lose mass, the trigger pressure is zero. So then my water potential is equal to my solute potential, which is equal to negative ICRT, right? And it's in sucrose, the ionization constant is one. The C is what? 0.32. Moles per liter, which is molar, right? Molar. Then what? You already have it already measured. I mean memorized. Liters per bar, moles per Kelvin. And then what do we have to do? Temperature, what do we gotta do? Right? Okay? See, they give you the formula sheet, but you will have used the formula so much, you won't even need their formula sheet. You'll be like, whatever. Okay? So I know you can do that. Okay, take a look at this one. This was a grid in. Now I'm going to tell you, you get a grid in like this, okay? 
Um, you get in a, a grid in like this, what you can sometimes think about is go, okay, wait a minute, that's worth just as much as a multiple choice question. So if you're sitting there struggling and going, grid in where I have to come up with an answer, or multiple choice where I have to guess one of five, mm, statistically speaking, not with a multiple choice, okay? So don't spend 20 minutes, I didn't even see Ms. Chevalier walk, on, walk in here. We're working together today. Um, don't spend so much time on it that you don't, um, you can't work on a multiple choice question when you're taking it. I'm not going to solve these for you right now because it's going to take away the learning. I already solved one for you just now. Okay? But look at the grid ends. Try these. We have time before the test to talk about it, but I encourage you to look at that. There's another one. This would be like an essay question, like a free response essay question. The selectively permeable plasma membrane is composed of phospholipids protein, which allow for unique functions. You would go, I already know that. Why did you tell the people that in the essay? But that's what they're going to do. Okay? And then it says, describe the structure and properties of phospholipids and explain the important roles of phospholipids in the plasma membrane. Now that's going back to your understanding of the four important organic molecules, right? And remember our lipid, fat, glycerol, three fatty acid chains, Remove one of the fat, fatty acid chains, replace it with phosphate. Significance, right? Phosphate, negatively charged, fatty acid chain, not nonpolar. So it's hydrophobic, whereas the phosphate is hydrophilic. And then your cell membranes are two layers of those phospholipids, with the core of the membrane being hydrophobic and then hydrophilic on the edges, right? And how we sit in water, each of our cells, and how that can interact, right? So you could talk about that. Predict how the normal, this is, they want to make sure you understand it. Predict how the normal function of a plasma membrane would be altered if all the phospholipids were saturated. Now, who has unsaturated fats primarily? Plants, okay? Animals also, they're fought, you'll see a straight and one in, crooked one, right? <laughs> She's done. And so, but what if they were all saturated? all saturated, all the chains would be what? Straight. What would they do? In cold weather, they'd probably freeze, and in hot water, they would, I mean, hot temperature, they would no. fall apart. What holds those together and spins the gaps to keep the fluidity of the membrane just right? Cholesterol. Yeah. So it says, what it wants you to predict, explain the effect this would have on plants located in very cold regions. It would freeze. Possibly it could disrupt the integrity of the membrane, right? And then you wouldn't have that control. Then you'd only have the cell wall doing it. Yes? So if it would freeze, would that mean that nothing can go inside the membrane? Well, anything could if it was, if it was oh, broken. As long as it could fit through the, the spaces in the cellulose of the cell wall, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Then C says proteins are an important component of a cell membrane. Oh, hello. Hi. Proteins are an important component of a cell membrane. Describe two specific functions of proteins in the membrane. Channels, carriers. Now, if on a test I tell you two different functions, channels and carriers both do the same thing, right? Okay, so some of you are still doing that kind of business. Stop. Okay? Don't go, I don't know, so I'm just talking about channels and carriers, and then I'll just hope to argue with her later. No, it's just annoying to me. Okay, so you might want to talk about transport. That would be one role, and you could bring up channels and carriers if you wanted to. What else? What would be another function? What? Cell recognition. What else? Enzymatic, right? So those are the different things you could bring up. Then it says describe the role of each protein you select for part in part C. Look at that, it made that. Based on the structure and properties of the protein. How can it do what it does based on the structure of the protein? See now how it's harkening back to that you need to understand and have an idea of the protein structure and how that can affect its function, right? If you're a receptor, you have a particular shape, okay? That relates back in our preparation of our old school question and enzymatic function, yes? Okay, so you could talk about that. All right, so I'll let you work on that one. And then there's one more. Organisms capture and store free energy for use in biological processes. Each of the following parts plays a role in the transfer of energy. Describe how a photosystem converts light energy to chemical energy. You're all, I know it. 
Oh, is somebody there? Hi. Who am I talking to? Hi, Jonathan. Okay. <laughs> so, um, you want to describe that photosystem? B, explain how glycolysis releases free energy from the glucose. Okay? Describe the role of water in both cellular respiration and photosynthesis. Could you do that? Yeah, of course you could. Okay? Yeah. Okay? So those, these that we have right here, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. No. From here on, these were more new school type questions. You see the difference in how they are? The old school ones are very content driven, but these are more application based. Explain the significance of this. How does carbon cycle through living organisms? That's how you need, you can see the difference, okay? Okay, work on those. We have a review tomorrow for what? Eight. Chapter what? Eight. Eight, yes. And then remember Thursday, I'm not here, right? And then our quiz is when? Friday. Friday. Yes. Uh, can we go back to that last question? Sure. You have all the questions. No, no, you have the Any, yes, wait, shh, I can't hear. Shh, go. I cannot hear. Please stop talking, children. I can't hear you. Is that Thursday? No, I don't see you Thursday, right? I'm not here on campus. Yeah. Okay. Make good choices. Have a piece of toast.